Hello, friends and family, and welcome to the Global Crippling Anxiety Meditation Hour. Uh, ground rules as usual for anyone who's watching this and maybe doesn't know me. Um, this is not meditation instruction, and I am not a meditation teacher. This is just a conversation back and forth between friends. <clears throat> In the last video, I mentioned that I would be discussing this idea that meditation is generally coming outward in. Um, and I think there is such a thing as bad meditation instruction. Um, we can go into this in more detail in a future video, but um, meditation instruction, which is vague or imprecise, not actionable, um, involves mysticism. Uh, this kind of meditation instruction always has problems, at least for me. Um, I, I think that meditation instruction makes sense when it is clear and actionable and easy to understand. Um, if there's one thing in the world that doesn't need to be confused by a bunch of philosophy, it's meditation. Um, and so there is one branch of meditation instruction which it takes this idea of going from the outside to the inside, <clears throat> but leaves it at that um, and just says, oh, go inside, F find yourself. Um, go into your mind, go into your body, um, but never actually explains what any of those words mean. And I think that that particular set of phrases, the, those ideas can be reified quite easily. Um, we can pick a sort of set of concentric circles. Um, and as we go further and further out, we are getting nearer and nearer to um, something that is really not ourself, um, something that is imaginary, something that is um, far removed from what we want to be focused on when we're meditating. And um, meditation at its most practical seems to be an experience of self-discovery. Uh, so we want to kind of work our way inward toward that. So on the outside fringes, I think for someone capable of meditating at all, um, there are mental illnesses and um, mental health difficulties, um, such as, as we've <laughs> discussed in, in constructing um, this little video series, this sort of uh, paralyzing anxiety. Um, and there are other forms of paralysis. So analysis, paralysis, I, I can't decide which way I want to go, what thing I want to do. Um, and there's paralysis on the other end of the spectrum, uh, debilitating depression and I can't get out of bed and I can't um, go to work and I can't motivate motivate myself to enact my role in society um, and this is this is kind of the the outer sphere right like once you get to this you're not you're not going much further beyond that so when it when it comes to getting stuck, um, getting stuck in a spiral of depression or a spiral of anxiety is as far removed from your meditation object as as possible. Um, and so the the very fact that you can draw yourself back into something totally real, be it the breath or the body, um, is quite a contrast to that because even a moment of the breath is you know it's true you know that it is a real thing um, and 
you're you're removing yourself even for an instant um, completely away from all these other things and uh, in the long term obviously um, chronic anxiety chronic depression um, and and other um, forms of mental illness uh, therapy and medication and other things will help a person to move away from that um, and closer to to something real um, but there there are these these constructs um, that exist in society now so once we're once we're away from that once we're away from depression um, for a day or momentarily or for a year however long um, there has become a uh, constant feed of news and anxiety inducing anxiety in the flippant sense right not 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 debilitating anxiety but um, this kind of low hum of constant anxiety that sort of plagues all of us that bother to watch the television or go on the internet um, and it is, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy that once all of us are connected through our phones and our laptops that, um, that you're, you're going to wind up with uh, an ecosystem that is inherently unhealthy to some degree. That it wants your attention and how it gets your attention is by figuring out how can it get your attention. <laughs> so what are what are the chemical responses in your brain that um, that cause this attraction and how can we exploit those etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and i i kind of uh, phone phones and tv and computers uh, i kind of put these in the same um, concentric circle as other things which are um, external to our experience um, in such a way that they might be involved in this sort of ecosystem of attention. And other things in that sphere are things like, um, it may sound negative for me to say this, but friends and family, right? Your friends and your family are as bound up in those systems, they're watching CNN, they're on Twitter, <laughs> they're on Facebook, right? And it's very likely that you're talking to them through Facebook. Um, and so you can't really extract one from the other. And so um, it's not uncommon that our conversations these days uh, with our friends and family tend to be about the material which is kind of fed to us through this um, amoeba or through this machinery of attention grabbing. And so even when we're not on the phone, it still has our attention. Um, how many conversations in the last, how long has it been? Three years? <laughs> Have been about Donald, Donald Trump, right? None of us care about Donald Trump. None of us want to talk about Donald Trump, but it, he comes up in conversation. He's the go-to example for this uh, video for a very good reason, right? Um, now it's healthcare. Now it's race relations. Um, last year was something else, right? But these things keep bubbling to the surface and, and manifest themselves outside of the spheres where the, the cycle of attention gathering um, first emerges. Um, and I, I think to a lesser degree to some extent, but it's hard to say how much uh, to a lesser degree. Um, books and philosophy also sort of uh, live within this concentric circle. Um, an author that you really enjoy, a contemporary author, is still influenced by this system um, as much as you are. 
And even if the author is not contemporary, you have to think about the incredible lengths of human society's development up until the point at which that author wrote. It's likely that if the author speaks and writes in the same language that you speak and write in, um, they are effectively contemporary to you. Um, so if you're not reading something in uh, Sanskrit or Latin or some other language from a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, that that this person has a lot of ideas that um, that you hold and vice versa to some degree, right? Um, so in modern society, these news cycles and information cycles get tighter and tighter and wound tighter and tighter, but they're also easier to let go of, right? Um, sexism and racism and the structural problems of society have been around for a long time and perpetuated for a long time using a lot of the same machinery over the years. Um, and those structures are, are bound up in ideas. And the difficulty with ideas, with the difficulty with philosophy, with a religion, um, and when I say an idea, a philosophy, a religion, I'm including science in that, right? Um, I have never built a large Hadron Collider. I have never um, run most of the experiments that I tend to believe in, and it is belief. I, I have reason to believe that um, these experiments were conducted and they were confirmed by other scientists and, and they're proving um, some measure of truth, but, but these are all ideas. Um, science is an extremely valuable idea. I'm not deriding science here, but I'm saying that um, it is not direct. Uh, unless you happen to be a scientist, and even then, it's only direct for the experiments you conduct yourself. Um, so this sphere of ideas is quite a large sphere, um, and uh, it involves other people where perhaps um, debilitating uh, ideas or debilitating imagination, debilitating rumination, um, as found in anxiety and depression, don't necessarily involve other people. Um, I had I had a friend who <laughs> um, who before taking his first vipassana course, uh, we were discussing vipassana, and he was imagining what it might be like, and so he was saying, "Oh." I, like my, in his words, my most meditative experience, the thing I think is meditation, is diving um, to strap on oxygen tanks and dive under the water and live with the fish, um, these beautiful colors in silence um, for some period of time. And I think that um, for a lot of people, there, there are experiences like this in life that we, 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 we are so accustomed to this second bubble, right, from the outside. So some of us are accustomed to debilitating anxiety. Um, some of us are not. But we are all accustomed to the second sphere of uh, news and ideas and books and philosophy and ad nauseum. I mean, this is the stuff that life is made of. And from that perspective, it can often seem like something like diving or something like the flow state of a violinist um, is meditation. Uh, it is not. Um, and uh, more dangerously, on some level, and I think still within this sphere, is deep intellectualization. So I remember doing this a lot as a child. I would, like, apropos of nothing, I would I would sit or lie in bed late at night, and I would think, oh, the meaning of life. Let me puzzle this out, 
right? Let me let me tease apart all the pieces and let me construct uh, philosophy for myself, and it will be. I don't need religion, and I don't need all the philosophical scholars of of the ages. I'll I'll come up with on my own, um, and it feels like that's getting close to home to theorize, to intellectualize um, the external world and say, oh, okay, I, I see it in these ways and in the abstract, especially within the world of mathematics, right? You can speak in terms of re pure, for some value of pure um, abstractions and you can get away from many other ideas, but mathematics itself is still an idea. And anything you intellectualize um, can be written down. So anything that you intellectualize within yourself can be brought back out to this sphere above it, uh, can be turned back into books, can be turned back into philosophy. Um, and very easily, one for one, more or less, right? You're, you're not necessarily losing anything that you've intellectualized if you write it down well, if you do a good job of conveying your ideas. Um, so intellectualization uh, feels like you're getting closer to the center of whatever it is we're talking about here, but um, but still adheres to um, almost all of the constraints of these external spheres. And so I've 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 added this as a note. I'm not sure if this is um, a good idea to to leave this in here, but I've added one extra layer before we get to inside, right? Um, so intellectualization is still outside. This is still the world of the imagination. Um, there's a kind of boundary. Um, let me hold up my left hand so you can see it. It's almost camouflaged against the window. <laughs> um, this boundary state is still an idea, but it's the right idea. Um, and this comes with all sorts of problems, right? Oh, this philosophy is the right philosophy. This philosophy is the right philosophy. It's only the right philosophy if it takes you from outside to inside, um, according to this model that I'm constructing, right? Um, and so there, there is an idea um, within the scope of Buddhism, um, which is known as right thought, um, what are the right thoughts? Well, the right thoughts are the ones that that bring you toward this meditative state, that f introduce you to exploring yourself. Um, so take that or leave it. Right? Um, I don't. I don't think anyone should subscribe to the idea of right thought until they've looked at it from the inside out and said, "Oh yes. Oh okay. That's." That's the bridge to get here. That's a good idea that would cause someone to bother exploring the inside parts. Um, but that's why I set it up as this kind of boundary. It's a very thin, if the, the second sphere of um, news and books is very thick, then this one is unbelievably thin and maybe it doesn't exist. Um, and the the sort of, um, last sphere before we talk about the internal spheres um, is, is sort of all the internal spheres and external spheres at once, right? Um, this is another category of meditation instruction I would describe as bad meditation instruction um, because it, it is not necessarily non-specific, but it, it suggests that a beginner can do uh, very complicated and very difficult things um, just like that. Um, oh, you want to learn guitar? Pick it up. You'll do great. <laughs> and I think that there's a, there's a difficulty uh, with meditation because a lot of it is so simple that people treat it this way, that uh, it's like flying a plane or a helicopter or um, brain surgery, right? Like, oh, any of those things, yeah, it's, <laughs> they're very simple. Just go ahead and start. Um, 
And so this meditation instruction, which I'm referring to is, oh, just, just accept whatever is happening. Um, and another variation of this is just be in the now, right? So whatever your sensory experiences happen to be, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling, you know, just accept it all. Um, and that's okay, right? You can do this at a very high level, but you're accepting very gross reality. You're accepting the same reality that you experience while you eat breakfast. So this isn't, um, this isn't a particularly deep meditation. You're not going very far inside to say, oh, I, yes, I, oh, I'm feeling angry. I accept, I accept. Um, oh, my leg is numb. I accept. Um, this this is not a bad practice. It's not an unuseful practice, um, but it is on the outside. Uh, or again, this is kind of border condition. Um, and beyond that, uh, largely we need to work with um, individual sense doors. And um, the sense doors here are, uh, are worth enumerating um, so the, the reason to specify a single sense door is because, um, the sense doors are, uh, are kind of in constant conflict. Um, and you, you have to accept on some level that, um, well, okay, I accept on some level, you can accept or not accept. Um, that you actually cannot focus on multiple things at one time. You are not a multitasking machine. Um, human beings, or at least I, am very single-threaded. And so when it comes to the mind and the attention and where is the mind and where is the attention, you can only really put it in one place, which is why to talk about the sense doors individually. Um, the sense doors are the same six sense doors that we talked about before. Um, so the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, the body, in particular the skin, but the whole body inside and out, and then the mind. So the mind is constructed of uh, thoughts and, and emotions. And it's important to identify that um, in historical literature, but even if you intellectualize this, the sense doors are captured in this particular order, top to bottom, for a reason. If you think about sight as a sense door, it is far and wide the hardest sense door to really get a handle on. Um, it's the thing that tells us the most about the external world. Um, we often think uh, of wisdom traditions, whatever you call them, um, Zen and other forms of Buddhism and Hinduism and yoga and all these things. We often talk about, or they talk about, the sight that a person gets when when you have the right vision, spiritual vision or whatever that um, that you see correctly. And that is that kind of hints to this idea that sight is extremely external um, and therefore very difficult uh, in terms of actually holding on to it as a meditation object. Um, sound next up. Right. So sound, if you're in an anoechic chamber, um, you can hear your blood pumping. I mean, maybe if you go for a hard run um, and you're in a quiet place, you can stop. And once your breathing calms down, you can hear your your heart pumping in your ears. Right. So it's actually an internal sense in a very literal way. Um, so there's nothing mystical about this internal external thing. It's literally outside my body or inside my body. Um, then smell, right? So smell can be internal external. I can smell blood if I'm punched in the nose, but I can also smell all sorts of other things going on inside my body. Taste, which really actually goes deep into a hole in the body. And then the body itself, which it, it is external, but 
mostly it's internal. Like the second I have tactile experience, um, it's inside my body much more so than um, the other four traditional sense doors. And then the mind. So the mind is easily the hardest of the sense doors to talk about because it is an abstraction um, to us. And it is um, intellectually so uh, easily understood as the most internal sense door. So if I go into a sensory deprivation tank, um, I may actually be able to close all five sense doors. I don't feel anything on my skin because I'm floating in salt water. I don't hear anything because my ears are under the water. Um, I don't smell or taste anything because I'm in a, an enclosed box and my mouth is closed and my eyes are closed in the dark for long enough that whatever residual information was in my optic nerves gets flushed out and I start to see true black. Um, so no external sensory information, right? Um, we're only left with two things. We can't sensorily deprive ourselves of the internal uh, sensations in the body. And um, these are actually what Vipassana focuses most on, external and internal, but internal especially. Um, and I can't deprive myself of thoughts and feelings, so the mind is still active, even when I'm sensorily deprived. Um, and you find this even when you're sleeping. I'm pointing at a bed. <laughs> um, so you go to sleep and most of your senses are, are certainly quieted, if not closed off, but your mind is still active. Your mind is still doing something. Um, and so this is, this is the order um, that we approach from outside in, this, this idea. And um, so in the last video, when I was talking about fences, uh, the fences are outside in the sense of the imagination. So it is our mind, the most internal sense, which can take us all the way out to the outermost uh, sphere of sensory experience, which is spiraling and getting stuck in rumination and um, anxiety or depression. Um, these uh, negative thought patterns which build on themselves and build on themselves and build on themselves. Um, that is the most outside because it is the most removed um, from our immediate experience in this model. So in our immediate experience, we can, we can read a book or we can think about it. Um, and that's at least now-ish, approximately now. But the book or our thoughts are, are always kind of bouncing between the past and the future, at least a little bit. Um, and our imagination itself is kind of a future-focused activity. Um, so this is a, a rough working model um, to think about this idea of, of coming from the outside toward the inside. Um, I hope it helps kind of explain why not to bother uh, with these, these other objects um, when it comes to meditation. When it comes to meditation, um, I would strongly encourage you to keep your goal um, internal. So the breath, the body, these, these things are very effective um, uh, meditation tools. And a huge reason for that is because they are devoid of ideas. Your breath does not want to convince you of anything. Um, your breath is not selling you a religion. It's not selling you an ideology. It's not selling you a philosophy. It's not selling you a political party. Um, so whether these ideals uh, and ideas are thousands of years old or from yesterday, um, they, they are inherently ideas and inherently someone else's. Um, and so 
this is why I was saying that there's a, a small layer of ideas that if they help you get inside, where literally inside and in, inside your sensory experience, um, where you are beyond ideas, kind of um, working toward freedom from ideas, um, which which is a hard thing to do, but um, it's worth doing even as uh, an exercise in curiosity. So that's probably more than long enough for today. <laughs> um, and since this has again gone on for half an hour, I'll, uh, I'll close by, by letting everyone um, do their own meditation today. Uh, I will um, I will sit with you um, uh, tomorrow. I'll try I'll try to keep tomorrow's video a little shorter. So I apologize for that. I'll try to keep a, a simpler topic on the table. Um, so I hope everyone is is healthy and I hope everyone is staying safe and good night. Take care.